Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so hopefully you saw the emails last week about downloading LabVIEW if you wanted. Um, so if you have downloaded LabVIEW and you want to go ahead and open it, that's what I'll be showing in lab today. If you can't download LabVIEW on your computer or really don't want to, um, it doesn't work well on a Mac, for example, you can use LabVIEW in the computer labs on campus or in our lab that we will be doing uh, or this class in, in person starting next week. Um, or you can remote log in to the CEAS computers to use LabVIEW there. So those are kind of your options um, from that. But if you want to download LabVIEW, there are the instructions um, that I put on Canvas and in the announcements on Canvas. Do note the first announcement I sent had the wrong serial number for it. Um, they had told me the serial number for NI simulation, not, not the LabVIEW program uh, by mistake. So do uh, try to do that if you want. I will be showing that in LabVIEW for today. We will start labs in person next week if you're eligible for that. So I'll be posting an announcement on Canvas of what groups um, because you'll need to be divided into two groups so that we'll only have 10 students at a time in lab and you will each have your own station um, for lab. So you may be coming to lab next week or you may be coming to lab the week after that, um, but otherwise we'll have the same lab experience. If you can't do in person and need to be uh, virtual, I know some people have told me that, but if you haven't and that really is the case for you, please do let me know so that I'm not assigning you to a day. Um, there will be a recorded and a version of uh, doing what you would need to do for the virtual lab. It will be a little different than in person because you're not gonna get to build things yourself as much. So it will be different instructions um, and you will have a little different requirements in your report. If you come in person and we'll be checking attendance to make sure you were there and get credit for the fact that you built it yourself in person. So that's how that will work. Any general questions or concerns about that? Or just to make sure that I'm not talking to a blank audience. You don't have to sign up for next week. I will be posted just randomly um, as either a group that you will either be assigned to next week or the week after. If that's somehow an issue for you one week or the other, do try to let me know. I'll try to accommodate that, but it gets um, it may be difficult with if there are a lot of people with requests for that. Okay, um, so this week we will be dealing with some signal analysis um, and talking about sampling frequency, particularly Fourier transform, which you should be about to get into in lecture if you haven't already, um, and frequency components of our signals, which we already started talking about a little bit last week, or a little bit in the last lab or the first lab, as well as filtering. Again, all of this is going to be in LabVIEW. So if you want to go ahead and open LabVIEW, go ahead. At the beginning of the lab handout, I put some general things about LabVIEW, like what the things in the tool palette do, um, just so you can reference. Um, there are two different windows you'll show in LabVIEW, so I'll show the rest of this just kind of as we're going along. Uh, what happens when you have an error? It looks like a broken wire. I'll show that as we go along as well. Um, but I'm really going to start here of what we're going to be measuring first is we are going to make a sine wave, and that's going to be our signal. Again, as we move on to more fun things that we can measure in real life, that might be measuring temperature over time, like we'll do in next week's lab, or it might be measuring an EKG or our blood pressure, things like that. Right now, we're going to start with a simple sine wave, and we're going to look at how we can um, look at this in time. We're used to a sine wave in time, but also look at it in frequency, which is our Fourier transform process. Okay, so let me start if you haven't actually opened up anything in LabVIEW before. But you, if you have downloaded it, um, if you start in your start menu, if you downloaded it and you search for NI for National Instruments, um, you should find LabVIEW. So it's NI LabVIEW. Uh, the newest version is 2020. If you have an old version or whatever, for whatever reason, that's fine as well. You don't need the newer version necessarily. Oh, and mine's already opening something for me here. Let me close this so it doesn't. Uh, normally, you'll get to this. If you haven't created anything before, you can say um, create project and then create blank VI. If you have opened something before, it should already give you that blank VI option. A VI stands for a virtual instrument, which is just the name 
of the file type in LabVIEW. So LabVIEW is used for a lot of instrumentation or for measuring things. Um, and in this case, when you're doing stuff just in LabVIEW, not attaching it to a physical sensor or device or a circuit board that we'll be doing in lab, then it's just a virtual instrument. It's something that you're simulating on the computer, um, even though it isn't existing in real life. So you'll notice when you do this, you get really three windows most of the time. One is the block diagram, it's white. One is the front panel that is gray with blocks on it. The front panel is where the user is gonna see pretty stuff. So it's where they'd see graphs or inputs that they get to select a button and change something about the program um, or any sort of displays or warnings or icons. But it's not where they have to see the nitty gritty of the programming that goes on behind the scenes. So LabVIEW is used a lot for like medical instrumentation stuff because um, people can write programs and then have it run with just the front panel visible so that things like doctors who don't have to know all the programming behind it can just see their graph of blood pressure and be happy with that. We're gonna learn how to actually program in LabVIEW, so we will need both panels. Front panel being more the user inputs, outputs. The block diagram is where we're gonna get into actual programming. So make sure you have the block diagram open. And we're gonna start by making an artificial signal. So if I right click, that's where I get my options. And those options are different in the block diagram than in the front panel. So in the lab handout, I do, have a table that says, here are the options you can get from the block diagram, here are the options you can get from the front panel, because they are different. Um, so some of the time you'll be like, I can't find where a graph is. Well, that's because you make a graph on the front panel, it's a user display, um, you don't make it on the block diagram. So diagram, most of the things we're gonna use right now are under express, or should be for you, um, because they're kind of a simplified version of what we're doing. And we're gonna make an input to this program that is a simulated signal. Again, an artificial signal of a sine wave. Later when we move into our in-person's labs, this is where um, this data acquisition assist thing is where we're actually gonna be able to pull data from a circuit board. So again, that's what LabVIEW is really good at, is interfacing with instruments in the real world. So when I make this simulated signal, I'm gonna start it as being, um, what did I say in the lab handout? Sine wave or square wave? I want to make sure I'm not telling you something different. We're doing a sine wave frequency of 100 hertz, and then there's a sampling rate of 1,000 samples per second. We're going to set the number of samples to 100. Okay, so my frequency here tells me how fast my sine wave oscillates. There's 100 hertz. My samples per second are going to be 1,000, and I want 100 samples. So when you're making this sine wave in lab view, or if you make a sine wave in anything, like you try to make a sine wave in Excel, what it's doing is really not a continuous uh, wave of infinite number of data points. It's actually only a certain number of data points, and you'll get to this more in lecture later on when you start talking about the difference between digital and analog signals. But a digital signal, like I have to make on the computer, can only exist for certain points of time. It can't have, again, infinite number of data points for infinite small measurements of time. So it's really making a sine wave with only, in this case, a thousand samples per second or a thousand data points per second. That seems like a lot. And in the case of something that's changing of a frequency of 100 hertz, that probably is a lot. If I made this frequency really high, though, I will get a warning that my combination of the frequency I've selected here and my samples per second won't work. Um, so we'll be kind of playing with these samples per second. It will be a big thing in any sort of measurement theory, which is classes sensing and measurement, that you've got to measure with enough data points or measure fast enough in time to accurately see your signal. Okay, so if my signal is changing a thousand times per second, like a sine wave, and I'm only sampling a thousand times per second, I may only get one data point per wave, per cycle. In which case, that might look like just a flat line, not a sine wave. If I have a data point here, then another data point here, think about one per cycle from that, where data points only at the tops from them. So I can't do that. Um, you want, in general, your sampling frequency always needs to be higher than this frequency. And you should learn in lecture class later on that our principles for how fast we need to sample a signal when we make it digital from it is at least twice 
the highest frequency component in our signal. And that theorem is called the Nyquist theorem, if you've ever heard of that before. So if our, if our frequency of our sine wave was 100 hertz, we'd really need to be sampling at least 200, although that's an absolute minimum. You may not get a great signal at that, as we'll see. Um, more practically, five or 10 times that is normally good. I don't probably need to sample at 10,000 samples per second because it won't look much different. That's storing too much data and is too costly for things. So be getting a lot more into that when you, um, again, talking about the difference between analog and digital signals. But we'll go ahead and be doing that for now. So I'm just making my sine wave. And then once I have my sine wave for this first part, um, when I told it 1,000 samples per second and my number of samples to be 100, then how much time do I think I'm actually collecting? So 1,000 samples per second and you keep 100 samples, how much time is that? You can either unmute a mic or type in the chat. Yeah, good, Michael, a tenth of a second, right? Take a thousand samples per second um, or a hundred samples and I divide by that from it, I'm gonna have a tenth of it. So I expect that my graph in time would only be for 10 seconds. So it's important to have an idea of how long you think you're looking at time too. Okay, um, we are going to not look at it just in time because that's interesting, but not super useful. We're gonna look at it in frequency as well. So that's gonna be using our Fourier transform process. Have y'all started talking about Fourier series or Fourier transforms yet in class? I know Dr. Talbridge was um, mentioning some prep work to start getting into that. I just don't know whether he got into any of that today or not. He mentioned it today? Okay. Well, our Fourier series in a more simplified version than I think he's going to do in class, but he will be talking about it probably the next few class days, um, is that we can take any signal as long as it repeats, no matter what shape it is, whether it's a square wave, a triangle wave, looks like an EKG, whatever, and divide it into sine or cosine waves, which are really kind of the same thing, um, that have individual frequency components. And to do that, we are transforming a signal from time domain, where a sine wave looks like, right, our nice curves, to frequency domain. So instead of time being on our x-axis, which you're probably most used to with graphs, we're going to have frequency, which how are frequency and time related to each other? So frequency has units of hertz, which is like a sample per second or a cycle per second or one per second. It's really the inverse of time, OK? He'll probably go into a little more detail in lecture class about the Fourier transform. Um, yeah, and he, okay, introduce more transfer function log scale plot. Okay, and we'll talk about that later too. Um, what we're going to do is make LabVIEW do all the scary math that you'll get into for a Fourier transform sum uh, for us. So it will convert from time domain to frequency domain, to so looking at frequency components of signals instead of what does my signal do in time. So to do that, we are going to go to express again from our block diagram, signal analysis, and say spectral. This is really um, the frequency spectra is another way to think about that. And when you did those transfer function plots and you did a log-log scale, the x-axis of that log-log scale was often logarithm of frequency. So you're graphing in frequency, not time which is what the Fourier transform does for us. Okay, so when we do this spectral measurement, which is converting it to frequency, we wanna call it a magnitude. And this RMS really means it's a root mean square magnitude. You don't need to know that for right now, though we need to talk about it later. And we're gonna have our results in decibels. A decibel is a logarithmic scale. We talk about that. So that's kind of our log log plot for things anyway. Um, the rest of it, you can just say, okay. And what's magic is LabVIEW, if I hover over the little uh, arrow out of here from my sine wave, I can send my sine wave as the input signal to here. And what comes out, this label here that says FFT, this is what's called the fast Fourier transform. It's a way to take a digital signal, again, something that only has certain data points in time, 
uh, infinite measurements in time, and convert it to frequency domain. From there, we would like to see this as a graph. Okay? So to make a graph, I actually need my front panel, not my block diagram. And I could either just select graph here, or I get used to right-clicking and saying graph. The type of graph we want is a waveform graph. Make sure it's not waveform chart. It just doesn't give you the right um, axes labels. We want waveform graph. Okay, so if I have a waveform graph in my front panel, anything you make on the front panel will make an icon in your block diagram so that you can code to it. The nice thing about LabVIEW programming compared to like MATLAB or other programming, if you've done those more, is that it's more visual. So you're really like coding with wires. It's very much like circuits based on that. Because again, it was used for a lot of instrumentation measurement of stuff electrically first. So I just get to wire this into here. No typing of variables or anything needed. Okay. If I wanted to see my sine wave as well, I can make another graph. So again, just show that I'm going to right click. I didn't require you to do this, but if you want to, to just make sure that you know what it looked like in time as well. Here's my waveform graph. I get another one here. It's called waveform graph two, made a waveform graph one. And I'm going to wire my actual just sine wave, not once it was converted to frequency by my Fourier transform here, just when it was, should be in time. Although both of them right now look like time, but I promise it'll change. To know which graph is which, if you double click on a graph name, you can change it. So since waveform graph two is in time, I'm gonna call this graph in time. And again, you, I don't think I required you to have both, but if you want to here, just to show, be more useful later. Um, this is graph in frequency. Okay, if I hit run, you, it's the little white arrow. You can do it either from the block diagram or your front panel. This is what I get. In time, this looks like a sine wave, right? No surprise there. We expected to build a sine wave. That's what our simulated signal was. In frequency, what does this look like? So my x-axis here is now frequency, not time. Why do I get a peak here at around 100 for my frequency graph? Any ideas? So why would my frequency of this signal be at 100 in this case? It's really not a trick question, I promise. Well, when I look at what, yeah, good, Brandon, it's the frequency of my simulated signal. It's what I said I wanted to make my sine wave have a frequency of, and sine waves have a perfect single frequency. So that's where I see a peak here. But you notice while I had something, my sine wave in time would continue forever in time, even though I'm only looking at, as we calculated, 0.1 second, based on how fast we're sampling that sine wave and how many samples we kept. In frequency, I really get a peak here. And while the rest of this looks jagged, it's really not much. This is The rest of this is really all just artifacts from the fact that this is a digital signal. And it's not analog. It's not a perfect math mathematic function of a sine wave. It's really data points. And they drew lines connecting the dots in those data points. And when you do that, you don't get something perfect. But while this would continue forever in time, I really only get one peak in frequency. It wouldn't continue ever in frequency. That's a really important thing to know for measurement of why do we go through all this mess of talking about frequency, then talking about log log scale plots in frequency, talking about Fourier transforms, is because inevitably, if you want to measure something, you don't want to measure in forever in time, right? We all got better things to do with our day than spend forever <laughs> collecting data. If you can measure it in frequency instead, it's probably a more limited frequency range than it is in time. Like you think about your EKG of your heart will keep repeating forever and ever. But in terms of frequency, it probably only has certain peaks or certain components to it that I could see. So that's what we're doing there. LabVIEW did all the scariness for us of converting from time to frequency by doing that 
Fourier transform, in this case, a fast Fourier transform because this was a digital signal. Okay, questions or concerns over any of that part? That was part one. So we made our frequency plot um, and we graphed it. Both our simulated sine wave to a graph and um, made another graph to look at our frequency response. Okay, what we're going to do now, if you can't find the input in Express, there are other places you can find it. It depends on what yours um, is for things. You can always search in here for simulated, some of the time they get put in different places, simulated signal. Under signal analysis, so if that's the command I want, I can search for it um, and find it here. But you should find it somewhere for you if you're lab. Otherwise, I can help you once we're done talking about the whole lab if you're still having issues finding it. Because um, it may not necessarily be under Express, but for most people it is, I think. Okay. Um, what we're going to do now is change how fast we sample our sine wave. So we're now going to sample it at only 100, uh, sorry, at only 200 samples per second instead of 1,000 samples per second like we had before. Again, 1,000 samples, it looks like a sine wave, even though I really know it's individual data points with lines drawn between them. It doesn't look too dashed line. If I now double click on my sine wave, I can change this to say 200. When you're doing this for your report, do make sure you take a screenshot of your front panel for each time you do it. Otherwise, you can't put them in your report and talk about them. So screenshot front panel before you change the next part. So I change this to 200, and then I'm gonna hit run. It's the only thing I'm gonna do different. Here's my graph in time. Let's talk about it first before we get into frequency. Does this look like a sine wave? Yes or no? No, oh, lovely, we can at least identify not. Why not? My sine wave was oscillating 100 hertz or 100 cycles per second, and I'm sampling at 200 hertz. So I should get two samples per sine wave, right? But if I go back and look at an actual, if I make it higher so I can see it just to begin with, go back to 1,000. Oh, I said 100. Again, 100 is way too low. We'll even warn you about it. Just doesn't warn you about the 200 is also too low. Let's say I sample at exactly 200 cycles per second, and my first sample is right when the sine wave starts at zero. If I sampled at exactly my frequency rate, I'd have one sample per cycle. So I'd have one sample here, here, here. If I sample twice that, I'd have a sample here, here, also at zero, and then here, which could still look like a flat line if I collect connect the dots between them. It's because I'm not making enough samples to adequately see these changes in my signal, my sine wave, right? So I warned you that there's a technique that you will be talking about called Nyquist theorem that says you need to sample at least twice the highest frequency component in your signal. Well, 200 is at least twice this, but even that really isn't good enough. This looks like this is changing a lot. But if you look at your Y scaling here, it auto scales, and these are all to the negative 15. You're really basically measuring zero the whole time. It just gets slightly off with each measurement, so it's not gonna get a, like a perfect, the likelihood that you started your measurement at exactly zero is pretty slim. So if you're slightly off in those cycles, you can draw that um, from here. Let's say I started slightly up, then this sample would be slightly down, and then twice that would be slightly up here, and then more down. It'll shift more as it goes along. So in theory, if you sampled forever in time and then fit it to a sine wave, there'd only be one sine wave that would fit all those data points, even though it doesn't look like a sine wave right now. But practically, again, we said you're never gonna sample forever in time. So you really need to be faster or more samples than even just twice your highest frequency. That's why we put it at a thousand before, but we have it at just twice. We're gonna learn that lesson here that you will not get what you think your signal looks like. So if you sample an EKG and you have an idea of what frequencies should be in an EKG and you don't sample at least twice the highest frequency you have, 
it won't look like an EKG. It might look like a flat line. It might look like some other random shape, but not useful for measurement. In frequency, this went to all kinds of heck. <laughs> Doesn't look like I have a peak anymore for my 100 hertz sine wave either, because if I don't sample fast enough in time, I can't back pull out that frequency data either. So you don't really need to explain the shape of this graph except to say, I didn't sample fast enough to get an accurate measurement in time, so I certainly didn't get an accurate measurement in frequency either. Questions or concerns about that? Okay, we all kind of understand we got to sample fast enough for anything we want to measure in real life. Okay, so and when we get into measuring temperature next week, do we expect that temperature for things like, let's say, your body temperature, do we expect that changes very fast or very slowly compared to like your EKG voltage, maybe, or something like that? Do you think temperature is a faster changing signal than EKGs or a slower changing thing? Your body temperature, not like temperature of, you know, chicken in a microwave or something. Very slowly, yeah, temperature is pretty slow. So it means you probably don't, if it's slow, that's like low frequencies, it's not changing very fast. We kind of talked that, about that with our square waves in week one. Um, and so you don't need to have a whole bunch of data points in time. A thousand samples per second is probably overkill for temperature. It's not gonna be changing much even in a second. But if you're talking about an EKG, a thousand samples per second may not even be enough. So that's the idea between our measurement that we need to know that concept. Okay, so that was our single sine wave um, sampled at a lower frequency at 200 samples per second. We're now going to deal with square waves like we did in lab one. And we said square waves are different than sine waves. They look different, right? So if I go on my simulated signal, instead of sine, I can say square. Now I'm going to keep it at 100 hertz. I forgot what I said. So, um, Still 100 hertz, I didn't say to change that, but make sure we go back to our timing samples per second to be 1,000. We know 200 samples per second is not enough to make it look like what we want. Fact is an exercise. You have it here. This is what a square wave would look like at 200 samples per second. Does that look like a square wave to anybody? Probably not. No. Okay. But if I make it more samples per second, like 1,000, we had... That looks vaguely like a square wave. Not perfect, because again, digitally, I'm really only collecting lines between data points, so I don't get a straight vertical line. I get close. Right. So we're going to do that. What do we think our square wave is going to look like? We know what it looks like in time. When we convert it to frequency. So here's it in time. Looks like a square wave, so I am sampling fast enough to vaguely make it look like a square wave. In frequency, though, I get a peak not only at 100 hertz, but also at 300 hertz, at 500 hertz. If you sampled even faster, you would see that you could get frequency components up to 700 hertz, 900 hertz, all the way technically to infinity. So you remember what we talked about from lab one? Why would I get frequency components all the way up to infinity with a square wave when I didn't get that with my sine wave? Infinity is like high frequency components. What's high frequency or what's high frequency means I'm changing really fast. What is that in my square wave? Let me make sure. Yeah, the vertical part of our square wave, the vertical lines. I don't know if anyone's ever tried. Can someone try to unmute their mic and say something? I want to make sure that I don't just have like my speakers. Muted that I can't hear anything. It's weird to me when I'm just talking to a screen and I don't hear anything back. Uh, I can unmute and, and speak. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Lovely. Okay. So if you prefer to do that option, that's fine. I would just get a little paranoid talking to a screen that doesn't ever talk back. So either way, you can use the chat if you're more comfortable or always unmute. So thank you for that. Okay. So these vertical parts of my square wave, the vertical lines going up or down when it changes that, that's an infinitely fast change in time, which is a very high frequency. So if it changes over a short period of time, right, like that vertical, then it's a longer in frequency. 
if it stays constant in time, like my flat lines, it's shorter in frequency, like that would be a frequency of zero. Again, they're inversely related. Time has what kind of units are we used to time being? Doesn't actually tell me units on this x-axis, but it would be nice if it did. What do we think our units for time would be? Seconds, what's our units for frequency? Hertz, which, how is Hertz related to seconds? It's an inverse second, right? So they have inverse ideas. If you're short in time, you're long in frequency, like my vertical lines, infinitely fast changes. If I'm long in time forever, I am short in frequency. Like a sine wave continues forever in time, but I only saw one frequency peak. So keep in mind with our square waves, they aren't sine waves. They're made up a lot of different frequency components. As we'll see, we can kind of approximate a square wave. We add up a whole bunch of sine waves in our next part, but they really would have peaks of multiple things out to infinity. You get in interesting multiples from that. So that's what happens. Okay, questions or concerns about that part with our square waves? We had our single square wave here. Okay, we're now gonna sum sine waves because as I warned, really a square wave could be approximated by our Fourier series as a sum of different frequency sine waves. So we are gonna make us some multiple sine waves. I'm gonna go back and change this guy to a sine wave, not square. Even 100. I'm actually going to sample this at 2,000 samples per second just so I get even faster um, so I can make higher frequency signals and then still look like sine waves. Okay, so that's going to be 2,000. And then I'm going to click and say control copy, control paste, but you could go and make them every time if you wanted to. Um, again, from R Express for most of the time and then same simulated signal, but I'm just going to copy and paste because I like doing it. And I'm going to make myself three or four of them. I don't think I specified how many you need to make, at least more than three. You can make three, you can make five, you can make seven, whatever floats your boat. And I'm going to make them all different frequencies. So we're going to make this one 100 hertz like we had before. Then we're going to make, um, so that was 100 hertz, sampling rate 2,000 samples per second. Ooh, I need 200 samples to keep now so that I'm still keeping 0.1 seconds of data. So 200 samples, it did that automatic if I leave that check, good. And then we're gonna do what? We are going to make another sine wave that is 300 Hertz with an amplitude that's gonna be a third of our value here. And I'll show why that matters. You don't really have to pay attention to that, but just follow the rules here. And a sampling rate still of 2000 samples per second, 200 samples. So 300 Hertz amplitudes of a third. Double click on this simulated signal, 300 Hertz. He's going to faster instead of amplitude of one, he's going to get 0.33. Okay, now what else? I want one 500 hertz amplitude of 0.2, which is a fifth. There's actually a mathematical pattern here that math people get really excited about this in Fourier transforms because they think it's mathematically beautiful. But you know. amplitude of 0.2. And it's probably, I probably even should have sampled faster than that, but there was a limit of what it would do. And 700 hertz amplitude of 0.14. Let's try him. 700 is a fourth. And then again, he's not even going to be pretty. What I want to do is add up all these sine waves and then see what I get. To add them, I can go to mathematics. Numeric, or you can, I think, get it from Express 2. If I go to Express um, Arithmetic in Comparison, Ugh, I can't click on all of these at once. It's a lot of like, then numeric, and then I can say add, or you could just done it from mathematics. It's probably easier to find. I get a little add symbol in LabVIEW where I can wire two things as the input, these two sides of the triangle. One is the output. Kind of looks like our op amps, right? So instead of just having this one signal, I'm going to take this sine signal, add it with this one, which had a different frequency, different amplitude, and I want to add these as well. Unfortunately, the add symbol just like this only lets you add two things at a time. You can do a formula if you want to have more inputs, but I'm just going to practice with my add symbol. So I'm going to take the output of it, wire it in, and add this, right? So 
then I add these two, then I add this one. Adding doesn't matter which order you do it. It's a communicative process, it's fine. Take this guy, add this one, and then here's my output. I get to wire to here. Notice before I had this wire, and I'll go back and delete it. If you don't have your wire icon or you miss things, under View Tools Palette, you get their tools. You can either use the little wire guy, looks like a thread spool, or the little arrow. The arrow is useful if you want to click on something and like delete it. So if I delete this, notice I get a red X. That's LabVIEW telling me I have an error. If something isn't wired correctly, like it has no input. So here you go to here. OK. Added my four sine waves together. I'm graphing them in time. And then I take their Fourier transform to graph them in frequency. What do I get? Now, in time, if you kind of crossed your eyes, what does this kind of look like? Does it look like a sine wave? Does it look like some other shape wave? I know it's not perfect, but try to imagine what it's. These were flatter up here. Yeah, it kind of looks like a square wave. So it's kind of proving technically this would look more and more like a square wave the more sine waves you added of this in this mathematical pattern. And then in frequency, I got you know my 100, my 300, my 500, my 700. I can clearly see those. But I'm also going to get bumps for their multiples as they go up because, again, a square wave really has multiple frequencies in that um, from that. If I had sine waves that were completely perfect, I wouldn't see bumps here. But again, they're digital, so get a little extra bump. So this proves that kind of my Fourier series is, again, what I said, I can make any shape signal by summing up sine waves. In this case, I summed up sine waves to make it look kind of like a square wave. There's a much more complicated mathematical formula, obviously, of how you'd have to sum up sine waves to make it look like an EKG. It probably wouldn't be individual peaks. It would be something more like I have a lot of different frequencies between maybe 0 and 500 hertz. But then they start to die off as I get to higher frequency, because eventually you don't have infinitely high frequencies, even though you can go forever in time. So frequency is always going to be more limited than time. That's our adding multiple sine waves makes it look kind of like a square wave. OK, the last part we're going to do is play with some filtering. So the rest of that was showing you how to add the sine waves. Show our graph of multiple sine waves. We're going to go back and just make a single square wave. Uh, 100 hertz sample rate, 2,000 samples per second, 200 samples. So I did all this prettiness. Again, screenshot your screenshot your block diagram. Don't be like me and just delete it each time you do it. Otherwise, you don't have stuff. You can save them as different programs if you want. Again, as LabVIEW programs to come back to them. I'm just being easier here and delete this. Let's delete in mass, shall we? Delete all that. Just highlighting over and pressing delete. OK, now it looks like, oh my gosh, I've screwed up all my wires. I need this guy to go to here. Go in. I need this guy. We go to here. Why are sources in sine and afro add? It's a square wave. Good question, Fong. So when I add up sine waves, while a single sine wave only has one frequency component, like you could pull up sine of 2t has a frequency of 2 from it. I can pull that out from it. A square wave is not a sine wave, and it's really made up of multiple frequency components, or really multiple sine waves. Technically, you had to add up infinite number of sine waves to make it look like a perfect square wave. But we saw, even with just adding four sine waves together, it looks pretty close to a square wave. And that's basically what the Fourier series tells us, is that you could add up series of different sine waves of frequencies and get a signal that's a different shape, technically any shape you want, as long as it repeats in time. It does need to repeat, like sine waves repeat. Um, our square waves just happen to be infinite numbers of different frequencies. OK, so here I'm going to make a square wave. So I don't want sine. I want to go back to my tools palette. Where did my tools palette go? There it is. So I need my little arrow, not my wire guy. Click on him, change him back to a square wave, 100, 2,000 samples per second, 200 samples. And we are now going to filter him. So in lab one, we built filters right, with circuits virtually, I know, but we will be building them 
in real life too, Elena Labs. We are now going to build a digital filter. So no need to attach resistors or op amps or capacitors. We are going to make it filter digitally instead. So if I go under Express now, I'm going to go to Signal Analysis. And we did Spectral to get our frequency components. I'm now going to go to Filter. And when I, we talked about filtering in the last lab, I said filtering in this class or anything related to electrical engineering or measurement does not mean filter by size. So it's not filtering like by amplitude. What am I filtering by? So what am I separating differently when I filter? Like the filters you built in lab one. Good, yeah. Frequency. So we can either keep lower frequencies or higher frequencies, or you'll learn their fancier filters called like bandpass filters. You can keep things just in the middle, not low, not high, just stuff you want to know. We're going to practice with different filters here. These are digital filters. So we, again, didn't have to build an actual circuit with resistors or capacitors or stuff. Um, they took our digital data points, or again, our individual samples in time, and processed those samples in different ways. So if I have a low pass filter here, we're going to make our cutoff what? What did I say first? Low pass filter cutoff frequency of 200 hertz. Just like you designed your filters for lab one to have a specific cutoff frequency, you now have that here. When you were looking at the log log graphs for your transfer functions, when you get to filters, a low pass filter is flat at low frequencies. It's keeping most of those. And then it slopes off pretty dramatically after that cutoff frequency, saying I'm keeping very little of higher frequencies. They get lower and lower magnitude out. Keeping low or passing low, not keeping high ones. I'm going to say two. Leave it as the rest of this. Um, there are different types of digital filters, and you have probably digital filtered something before without knowing it. So when you calculate your grade in a class, or even just like, um, calculate your averages for a test. If you were averaging something, like maybe on one test you got a 60 and in the next one you got an 80, then they average to a 70. That averaging process, taking two data points, your 60 and 80, summing them up and dividing by the number of data points, is a filtering process. And it's actually a low pass filtering process. What you were doing was taking a data point that was low and one that was high and finding kind of the middle point in between them. You weren't allowing those fast changes in time. You're doing this. Now granted, you could have had five tests and still average that. That meant instead of having zigzags back and forth, you find kind of what their middle is. That's low pass filtering. So digitally to low pass filter, all you really need to do is average. Now there are a whole bunch of fancy things you can do with that. You can average over three numbers of data at a time, average over five, overlap what's called your windows and that, all kinds of cool things. But basically, it's just averaging. It's a little different than building our circuits when we do them. You can actually make fancier things digitally than you can with a circuit. Um, but that's what's going on. So here's my simulated signal that was a square wave at first. And when I filter it, here is it in time. Does this look like a square wave anymore? This graph here, does it look like a square wave? No, it does not. Instead of getting my infinitely fast changes in time, I only get curves like a sine wave. Now it looks a little different in shape than when you built your analog filters. Again, there are different ways to do this digitally. It doesn't curve up and then flatten and then curve back down. It kind of curves all the time digitally, but it smooths that process and finds an average. So that's what happened in low pass filtering. In frequency, it does little bit funky. I still see my frequency peaks, which I expect with a square wave. I just get a little more of them at lower frequencies because I'm keeping more of that. And as they get higher, they die out more. Technically, I made this cut off here. So I see that they die off more before that. It does not cut off everything above that frequency. It just makes them lower amounts or lesser amplitudes above that. Okay. So that was one filter. You're going to do it with a cutoff of 200 hertz. That's what I just did. You're going to then change it to a cutoff of 50 hertz, like we did in lab one. So note, your graph will probably change to look very different with that when you make that cutoff so low. If you restrict it to very low frequencies, you no longer get anything that even vaguely looks like your signal. 
You're then going to change it to a high pass filter. And this, I had an error. I said actually make the cutoff frequency for the high pass filter 5,000 hertz. If you do that, you will get an error. It should have been 500. Got a little too trigger happy typing zeros. Oh, I got to stop. There we go. Go back to my simulated signal. Oh, no, not my simulated signal. Sorry, cancel. Go back to my filter. Instead of a low pass, I can make it a high pass and change this cutoff. If you type actually 5,000 and try to hit OK, you will get an error when you run it. It is unhappy. You can't cut off things that high when you're not sampling that fast. You can't make those frequencies, right? Really needed to be 500. 500 is still above. The frequency we made this square wave, it was at 200 or 100 hertz. Let's double check. 100, right? Yeah, 100. But again, it has frequency components up to infinity. So if I cut off ones just above 500 um, or below 500, notice these get lower. These actually get higher amplitudes from it. In time, this looks really funny. Why does it look like this when a high pass filter? Well, the high frequencies or the high frequency components of our square wave, we said were what? They were the vertical lines, right? When I went up and then I went back down. Notice you still have those vertical lines. You go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down. You get the idea. What you don't have is the flat lines or the kind of curvy parts in between when you saw it as a sine wave. They get kind of smooshed into this. High pass filtering keeps fast changes in time. So if you wanted, wanted to only count, um, you know, those vertical changes or those big peaks and not little changes or flat changes with nothing, then high pass filtering can be really useful. If you have an EKG and it looks, I wish I, uh, I probably should draw on something. Let me actually draw on this. I can draw a view. Used to drawing on a whiteboard for this and, and forgot that I wouldn't have that option. Let's see if I can draw something. Here's my EKG. Right? Pretend that's a beautiful EKG. These lower humps that are a little slower might be lower frequencies than these parts here. If I high pass filter it, high pass filter, I may not keep these anymore, the slower humps. I will only get the big fast ones, one per heartbeat. So it can be a lot easier to, for example, count heart rate just by high pass filtering it and then counting those changes instead of having these little humps that were when my atria and ventricles relax, and we'll talk more about those interfering with the rest of my signal. So high pass filtering is keeping the fast changes or things that are very different. Mathematically, again, this is doing this digitally, we'll learn that a digital high pass filter is subtracting or taking a difference between things. And so if there's a big difference, I get a value. If there's not a big difference, because I'm not changing much, I don't get a value like the flat parts. So low pass filtering was actually averaging. High pass filtering here is taking a difference or only keeping those fast, big changes in time. Okay, that's basically your lab. Make sure you take screenshots of each thing as you do it. Um, there's instructions on the right up here. You need screenshots of your block diagram too if something changed that you can see in your block diagram. And then make sure you're writing this to explain what each of your settings were for each part, okay? Because you need to write it like someone can't use the, read the lab handout. They need to just read your lab report and be able to recreate what you did in lab view. Questions or concerns about any of that? We will be using lab view for all the rest of our labs in person. Um, I don't have limits on here, do I? In general, um, I think I normally restrict it to two to three pages that is text, but this has a lot of images, so make sure your images are big enough to see. Um, so a lot of it will just be your screenshot images, but you shouldn't be writing forever. You can probably write it in two, but I give a little extra to say two to three. I will add that to it, so thank you for noting that, Samita. Other questions or concerns? And again, you'll be assigned to a group either to come in person next week or the week after, or if you decide that you're virtual, 
um, for what the virtual assignment will be slightly different than in person. Next week, we are gonna start building our temperature sensors. So we'll get into some soldering, which is fun, and getting to measure actual temperature um, on ourselves, building a circuit to process that, and then using LabVIEW to see it as graphs and filters and all that good stuff. Makes more sense when you're measuring something useful instead of our sine waves and square waves I know we've been doing right now. If you have questions on lab one as well, please let me know. Remember it's due Thursday at midnight, so don't forget about it. When will we know which week we're in and will everyone do the same labs in person, just different weeks? Yes, everyone will do the same labs in person, just different weeks. Um, so you'll have the same experience and I will post uh, that tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, you should have a list, but I'll put an announcement on Canvas then of saying that divided. Oh, you might have missed this. What do you do for the lab the weeks you don't have to come in? You don't have to do anything for the weeks you don't come in. Um, there will be, still leaning with that idea to give you more time in lab that I will kind of record the intro to things that you need to watch before you come into lab. So you could do that the weeks you don't come in. Um, but you don't need to otherwise do anything if it's not your lab week. How long between labs are due if we're going to be doing the same labs for alternate weeks? So if you're assigned to lab next week, actually, no matter who it is, that lab takes two weeks to fully do. So if you're next week, you wouldn't be coming the week after that, but you would be the week after that. And they'll always be due a week later. Um, but it will then have a different due date, whether you're in group one or group two, to be fair with when you actually had lab time and were able to start the lab. But always a week after the last time you had lab in person to complete that lab. I always put like that on the lab handout, but it would then say group one's due Thursday this day, group two's is Thursday's the next week because they didn't get to start it until a week later. Does that make sense, Zach? Trying to be fair, but also realizing that, you know, we have to be slightly off in schedule to um, accommodate smaller groups. But it means you get more circuits fun per person because you get your own station and build your own things yourself instead of with a lab partner. So that's kind of fun. Any other questions or concerns? Yep, thanks, Catherine. Fung, I'll send an email tomorrow for an announcement on Canvas of what group you're placed in. I need to talk to tomorrow's lab to make sure if there aren't other people virtual right about it. So you will either be in person next week or the week after, but not both. But I will let you know which group you're in tomorrow. Uh, this lab video will be posted whenever I, I can stop saying recording now because no one wants that. Um, 